What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 23 of the No Labels Necessary podcast. Got a lot of things to go through today before we get into it. But first and foremost, look, y'all who are watching watching visually, y'all ain't going to see Corey, man. No. Yeah, he, no. he he's not only here with us in spirit, though he is here <laughs> physically. He is in the room. One of our cameras broke on that trip to Loom, to Tulum, apparently. I think EJ broke it, but... That's neither here nor there. We're thugging out this episode without it. So it's going to be a one camera episode. Y'all will just see my beautiful face. With that being said, appreciate y'all love on the Tulum episode. We definitely want to do more things like that as we continue to move in the industry and this podcast gets better. Um, and we want to make it better for y'all. Like y'all know, we want to get to a million subscribers for the channel so we can mm-hmm. keep doing really dope shit. But it starts to, with getting to 150,000 first. We're at 125 right now. So appreciate y'all's support. Make sure y'all share. If you care, make sure you share. And one more thing. Uh, Black Phoenix, buddy, you donated to the podcast. And we didn't even know that you can even do this. Right, bro. Like, 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 oh, shock. Seriously. <laughs> there's something called Super Thanks, apparently, under these videos. And... Black Paul Phoenix donated four ninety nine to the podcast just as a thank you. And matter of fact, Black Paul Phoenix, you did it twice, so nine ninety eight, bro. We we really appreciate that. Legitimately, we didn't even know that you could do this super thanks feature, but appreciate that. Um, and anybody else who wants to, you know, add to the collection plate, we are happy to hear have that as well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So let's get into today's topics because we have, we got a lot of things to get through. Uh, the first, we're back with our lo- at our regular location, so we're gonna start off with some advice. Let's kick it off right here. Very special clip for y'all. And my question is: Is it better to start in music back in the day, or is this the best time? Leo Cohen has very strong thoughts about today's music opportunities. Check it out. Get into the music business, the record business. This is a time for you to cobble together a little capital because it's not expensive and find stunning talent and putting them out in the marketplace. This is the moment in time I've never seen a more fertile business environment as it is today. Mm -hmm. That you can go tonight and record someone, ship it the next day, all around the world at zero costs, Mm -hmm. no manufacturing costs, no shipping costs, no everything, digital and inexpensive and very efficient. Remember, we used to make videos that cost us money to promote our songs. Now there's a YouTube. You can put a video up Mm -hmm. and get paid for it. Now is the time. You you may be too late if you Mm -hmm. keep waiting to get this paid. As you pointed out, Ja'Cory, when we first listened to that clip, <laughs> the last thing he was saying is, get this paper. Get this paper. <laughs> get this paper. And hearing uh, the same man that says, cobble this money together, say, get this paper, is just kind of hilarious, especially with his voice. But what do you think about his sentiment? I mean, I agree. Well, I mean, you know, as much as I can agree, well, I kind of know what we know, but it – the the path to get the artist seen is a lot cheaper, right? Like he was saying like, yo, I remember when it were X amount of cost to just get this song distributed in another country. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Today, it can be in all of the major countries for, you know, 999, whatever tune chord dish your kid or something like that cost. So it's yeah. like the, the barrier to entry is a lot, a uh, lot less inexpensive or a lot more inexpensive. Um, the barrier to attention is definitely a lot more inexpensive, right? Like now this artist can make a TikTok or a YouTube video or have an Instagram meme just hit the right way. And, you know, we get the same return as if we had took it to radio, you know, or something like that. Right. So I agree with in that aspect. And uh, I would say everybody too should go back and, and watch it or pause it to where he actually has those stats on the screen and talks about how much the, the music industry is gonna is gonna grow, you know what I'm saying, over the next couple of years. I don't know if you caught that part, but it was showing yep. like the breakdown of it by 2031 or something like that, right? Yep. Basically showing like yo, it's gonna be more. It's gonna be. It's, there's more money coming. The the way to get attention is gonna be a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible. All you have to do is be the one to bring the good talent to the internet that sparks and hit the marketplace. And I feel it. Like we were just having, you know, what I'm saying a similar conversation about that. Uh, you know, before the pod, 
Whereas like how many artists have we seen or heard stories of that cracked into the marketplace for a very low investment? Right. You know, like a couple right. of thousand or maybe a couple of tens of thousands. And so I feel like as, as, from their side, being someone that's, that's seen all those different eras, right? The couple of millions to break an artist era to maybe the couple of hundred thousands to break an artist era to like today could just be a good string of, of TikTok videos and it'd be done for possibly free. Like that has to be crazy to see, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I agree. Because you have just that lower cost means a higher margin, yep. right? Like, like you said, millions to get artists out. That was legitimately a number that was typical yeah. um, back in the day. And now we're talking about legitimately free. I remember hearing stories. I forgot which song in particular I'm thinking about right now. But someone dropped some music in the United States, right? And they didn't have the rights to distribute it internationally because they sold those rights to a company, right? because they are popping in the United States. So they own had ownership. They can get it in um, popping in the United States. And it was popping in the United States. It wasn't popping overseas. A company bought the rights to distribute it internationally. But back then, international distribution meant, I guess, just pushing out the CDs. Yeah. Right? So these people shipped it internationally, but then they imported it. And then we're still able to sell it in America and like undercut them, which was crazy. Right. But like that type of stuff is more difficult to pull off yeah, today, today. Right. Yeah. And the fact that they wouldn't even go to the lengths, though, <laughs> to do something like that must mean like the margin must, must to look pretty good on whatever song that was. I really wish I could remember the story and which specific song. But like now you yourself as an artist can have worldwide rights for basically nothing. You're yeah. not competing with these companies just to make sure it goes to the next place. So I, I 100% get that, the, the visibility and getting your product out there. Now, I think to his argument, if I said, yeah, but you still got to stand out in the marketplace, it still costs money to get seen, he'd probably be like, well, yeah, but that's still just a game. My point is, there's lower costs for the game. The game is still the game, but the but it costs less. So yeah. I, I can kind of get that. Yeah, and it's, I think they're looking at it too as, you know, in, in their time, it was kind of like, here's how big the pie is. And there are a lot fewer of us cutting into the pie versus today, and, you know, more than likely moving forward, the pie is going to get bigger as we saw in that chart. Hey, it's on like the music industry is going to like double or triple or something by like 2031. So it's like, hey, the pie is going to, hypothetically get much bigger, but they're gonna be a lot more knives cutting into the cake, you know? Yeah. Because of how cheap it is to get into it. And so that becomes the trade-off. And like you said, the game that you're playing, hey, we could argue that in that era, yeah, it was a lot harder to get attention, but it was a, a lot less people that, you know what I'm saying, they were able to benefit because of that. Today, you, you, and you all have the same chance of making it, you know what I'm saying, relative to, to what making it kind of looks like for now. But because of that, you know what I'm saying, it's going to be a lot of views. Right, <laughs> that, right. And what that looks like. And that's going to be the game that you have to play. You know what, when I think about it, when I see him make this argument, because I've seen him talk about this before, he doesn't necessarily say this is the best time for artists. Yeah, he says the most like lucrative. He even said the most lucrative. He's like, um, He's, he, uh, typically, one thing he kind of seems to specify around is like for entrepreneurs in music. Yeah. Right? So, of course, that could apply to the artist, but they could, that could not apply to the artist. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, we're, even, we're, not, we're not even making an argument here because that's not what he's talking about. Whether it's good or bad for an artist, is it easier today versus the old days? That's a whole other conversation, which we might have had. If not, we'll definitely have it. But I do agree 100% for an entrepreneur, this is the best time because before – you're dealing with more and more gatekeepers, yeah. right? There's less gatekeepers, so you have more wiggle room. You can use a lot more of your finesse, your savvy, your skill set to build leverage outside of the industry and make money. And then, of course, bring it in the industry and you have more routes to navigate versus we just got to go do these few major labels. We have to deal with the same people in the room yeah. and everything is limited in terms of their ceiling based on the major labels, which actually reminds me of what I said the other day. You remember, because even though it's better for entrepreneurs, as an industry, I still think music is 
has one of the lower ceilings for entrepreneurs. Yeah. You remember me talking about yeah, that? Yeah. And, and why is that? Because of those major labels, right? No matter what, no matter what your skill set, the highest ce- ceilings are still people who are attached to those majors. Yeah. All right. Where you could be in the restaurant industry, you could become a billionaire right off the restaurant industry, opening restaurants, opening restaurants. Oh, now I go buy and acquire another restaurant brand and I build out my portfolio. Tech, I build out some app, right? And it blows up. Bam, I'm a, I can go up to the billion dollar level, hundreds of millions of dollars level, roofing, real estate, all these, you can stay within that and continue to build. Everything has its own barriers, et cetera. But music, it's hard to be a ground zero person Right, yeah. become a billionaire straight like that, music only, because at the end of the day, the record labels create a ceiling for what you can do as an entrepreneur. Otherwise, Birdman would probably be a millionaire, billionaire. I mean, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, and they say, I think the number was like two billion dollars worth of music. Yeah, I think they said he's done two. Billion dollars worth of revenue or record sales, something like that, right? That's great. But for a Birdman level impact in a different industry, that number will be higher. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like people selling like dental equipment or something. Like, <laughs> yeah, like 40 facts. billion or some kind of crazy shit. It'll be, it'll be a higher number and it will be, he would have a bigger piece of the pie because he also had to bust that down between so many people. Yeah. Like I remember that just from doing. Uh, festivals even like you just look at it and you're like dang man yeah this shit can get bigger but the bigger it gets the more people that I need to be like uh, security just attendance helping people throughout the events more vendors and more people to manage those vendors like my regular team it takes more and more people as you scale so it's harder to ever get that escape velocity where at some point each person is worth more, right? Like if I'm building out tech after a certain level of growth, tech does so much, it becomes worth to people. You know what I mean? Like you're automating people and it's doing like what? WhatsApp had 50 billion. No, WhatsApp had 50 employees when it exited for $19 billion. You said 50 employees? 50 employees when Facebook bought it for $19 billion. Yeah, that's what like. I'm doing the math on it. Couple, couple hundred M's per head. Hey, you know what I mean? Like that's now. Of course, tech yeah. can be more extreme, but the point is, the ceiling is lower for entrepreneurs in music. However, within the periods of time, this is the best time for entrepreneurs in music. Let me take a quick second to say, if you're an artist trying to blow your music up, or if you're a manager, a music professional in general, trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you, and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply, it's completely free, but the thing is, We're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. Now we're talking about music specifically. I'm not saying that you can't get, you know, become a billionaire using the clout you build from music and then monetize it other ways. That's what an entrepreneur would and should do. Right. But that specific music ceiling the labels, man, they they got it on lock. You know, they're like, remember, I even talked about how, you know, when Gary V on that music run. Yeah. And I'm like, I really feel like Gary V at some point was seriously considering getting in the music business on a deeper level. Yeah, you could kind of see him trying to plant the seeds. Yeah, he, a he's an entrepreneur. Yeah. He had to at least think about it. Yeah. And he and knowing him, I which I don't know him, but seeing him <laughs> <laughs> let me re- let me correct that shit. All right, I don't know him, but seeing him enough and observing him enough, if he did truly consider it, 
he probably also considered that versus other opportunities that he has and what the worth for his time would. And he probably saw a, an exorbitant amount of politics, bureaucracy, and the ceiling that labels create to hit certain numbers. And it's like, dang, it's going to take how long just to build something to be worth how much when I could go run them numbers up in a couple of years on something else? Yeah, you know, That's the ceiling. And then when you think about how they talk about jobs that pay less, attracting lower talent in general, yeah, just because of the ceiling. I'm just saying, maybe music has the has a problem of attracting the best of the best op, uh, entrepreneurs yeah. in the long term, right? Because yeah. you'll have them maybe early on, the love of it, da da da. But like staying in it to change it, I think there's a low morale of staying in it to change it because we know to get to a certain number. If I want to keep keep going, right, eh, it gets real tough. Yeah, yes, yeah, I want to talk having a, a salesperson conversation. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, I could come over to music and let's say a music uh, service company, and maybe I'm selling this thousand dollar product, or I can go over to I can't even think of something like the medical like, sales, you medical sales, yeah, <laughs> like energy sales or something, and they said that their product is fifteen k a product. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. my commission looks. Different over there, and it's like, why would I do this music shit? You know, what I'm, saying? I'm making three, four hundred dollars a head over here, and I could be making, I don't know, like five to eight k a head, right? For, for some other company, so that, that's a good point, man. And I think that's that's what makes music like beautiful and slow at the same time. Is like you're banking on the progression of the space being just by people who are just passionate about the space, not yeah. people who are necessarily coming. Like there are people who come in saying like, hey, I think I can make money here, but we in part are largely hoping it's just people who are passionate about it. They keep right. pushing it forward. Even if they have to do things in other spaces to still come back to this space and then push it A forward. lot of people do that. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. are, yeah, not just on the artist side. There's a lot of people who are doing other things while staying in music to keep that going yeah. while they got to hustle. And I think, like you said, there are people who come into it for the money purely at first, but those people don't last. Yeah. Because they do the simple math. You know, I mean? unless that's like your only opportunity in life because you got other life things going on, which is a thing for some people. Like most people, if they're just purely from the money, you do the math and you're like, there's so many easier ways to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, like, I, I I get it. I get it. Well, it's interesting. So we we kind of like we we broke down that we do agree with Lior, but there are high, there are caveats, right? Yeah, some yeah, some so, hypotheticals in there. That... So there's a, yeah, there's there's <laughs> it's the best time, but it's still not the best industry if we're just talking about for entrepreneurs. However, if you're an entrepreneur who's passionate about music, yeah, cares about music, time, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you're an artist who wants to be entrepreneurial and have more control over your situation, it's also in fact the best time. That's I think the conclusion on that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now. Second clip, though, man. Outcast manager says he never understood these fools. He said he understood stand these Southern guys. Now, let me play exactly what he's talking about when he says this, though. Being from New York, managing Outcast at the time, first of all, there was a complete language barrier. Mm. I know what the fuck nobody was talking about <laughs> sitting around the dungeon yeah. with all the language. <laughs> yeah. I sit in the room some days with all of them and be looking around like, I don't know what the fuck y'all talking about. Artists, y'all might be wondering why we're playing this. I promise this is extremely important for you to understand and get. But okay, we'll figure it out later because it was just a different like language, really. Like you, especially not <laughs> just TV quiet, version. Right? Yeah, I'm saying not this TV version, y'all. So like, I'm talking about the dirt, the, the OMP <laughs> when them niggas was talking like this. The words blur. Like I didn't know what the hell nobody was talking Shit about. Shit got down with the fuck. You yeah, know what I'm like, saying? Like, yeah, like, yeah. Did you just say like, three huh? things? Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You just like did y'all just say three things? <laughs> And then periodically you hear, fuck New York. You be like, oh. <laughs> heard that loud and clear. Wait, hold right, on now. Yeah, yeah, like, I know I heard fuck New York somewhere in here. So being from New York, managing Outcast at the time, first of all, it was a- <laughs> All right, all right. So the biggest thing, point number one, that's really important to understand, but there's multiple that we need to get into, is artist. You see, this is a world-class group, legendary group, Outcast, And their manager said, he didn't understand them, what they were saying half the time, literally. But also, 
they also don't have to like you. And we that we had some recent conversations with some pretty successful people that manage some pretty successful artists. And they don't like the artist's music like that. They respect it and think that they're good at what they do, but that type of music is literally not for them. Yet they're successfully managed in these artists and these artists are doing damn well in their career. That's important to note. And why? Because so many times artists say, I don't want nobody to market my music if they don't believe they don't in believe. me. If they don't believe, you got to drink the Kool-Aid. And you look at me, I'm like, I'm a rebel. I'm, I'm going to not drink the Kool-Aid just because you told me <laughs> I got to drink the Kool-Aid. No, man, hell no, I ain't drinking the Kool-Aid now that you say I need to drink it. But like, that's the thing. So many people think that everybody on your team has to believe in your music, mm -hmm. right? In, in terms of, I'll I, I, I take that back. Like, think they have to love your music, be a fan of your music. No, they don't have to be a fan of you. Yes, men. Yes, woman. None of that stuff. Now, what you want them to do is believe in what you can accomplish as an artist. Something about your vision. Something about your vision. Yeah. Yeah. They have to also tend to like care about you and want to do right by you. That's yeah. what I, I see to be the commonalities between managers. Because you got to remember, look, ain't nobody going to like everybody's music in general. And if a manager's has the skill set to market different types of artists and diverse artists, then they're probably not going to be the main category and target audience. Scooter Braun managed Ariana Grande. That older white man at this point is not <laughs> anywhere near the target audience for the teenage white girl. Well, I don't even say just white girl, but you know what I mean. You get the point, mm -hmm. right? They're for teenage girls. That's like where her music was at one period of time. And this is a man frat guy. Yeah. Like it doesn't connect, but he can manage the hell out of her, which he also managed Asher Roth, and he also managed Justin Bieber. He also managed Kanye once at some point, but I, you know, but if we want to talk, you know, starting more ground zero, those artists that I mentioned. So you do your manager doesn't have to like your music in that way, and they don't have to um, like your music if they're your market or anybody in your team in, in that way, but they need to see some level of packaging for you, right? And oftentimes kind of just, just like you, for lack of better words. Yeah, I think it changes from person to person. Yeah, right? I don't even say like maybe, but yeah, yeah go, go with yeah, what you, what do you think for person to person? Yeah, it just changes like some people, like, like you said, there are managers I know that work with their artists uh, just because they think the music is amazing. And then there are yeah. some that I met where they're like, hey, like this person's content is amazing. Like, yo, I can see his yeah. his vision and the way he's able to string it together. Or, or, you know, some that just like the way the artist performs. Yo, he's an amazing performer. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you meet so many different people that if you ask them enough questions, you can start to figure out, like, why. Oh, they can start to justify, like, why they rock with their artists. And it's not always the music, you know, which it, which used to baffle me because you meet so many artists who get offended if it's not the music. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah, Yo, you don't think the music is great? It's like, no, nah, it just might not be the target demographic. But if I understand how to put it in front of the target demographic, you know what I'm saying? Am I still not just as valuable in this relationship? And that's what used to get me, bro. Like, I've literally had conversations with artists before. I'd be like, yo, like, just because I don't like it don't mean I don't know what to do with it. You know what I'm saying? Um, they don't get that, though. I just though. don't like it, bro. Like, it's just not for me. But, yo, like, you clearly believe in it. You know what I'm saying? I'm seeing some high quality things around it. The team seems pretty solid. Like, yeah, I'll put my skills in this this situation and see what happens, you know, but I still don't fuck with it. Bro, that gave me a flashback. <laughs> There's this Breakfast Club interview where Machine Gun Kelly is trying to get Charlemagne to fuck with him. Yeah. Like his music. And like Charlemagne keeps going, I think you're a good guy. I don't like your music, yeah. basically. And he just like he can't take it, right? He really want. I think he like freestyled and everything, and then Charlamagne was just like, "Nah, I'm still not feeling it," yeah. or, whatever. <laughs> or whatever. But I think you're a good guy, and that's kind of what you want a lot of sometimes, right? It, it as long as they like rock with you, they have the skill set to do what you need them to do. You can't expect some of these, especially really seasoned managers who are older, who, to be your primary demographic. Yeah. Yeah, bro. I think it, and it, it's like a safe space for artists, right? Like when you're first coming up as an artist or I will argue when most artists are first coming up, their first um, round of help is usually just fans. You know what I'm saying? Like there are people who are fans of them reaching out to them. 
Yeah. Helping them out. So I feel like they just get stuck in that mentality a little bit. Like, yeah. oh, you're trying to help me out. You must be a fan. It's like, nah, bro. Like, I just thought I could help over Right. You know? See, exactly. That's that's not the business way of thinking about things. Like you said, I just saw something that I could help with. I saw a place that I could provide value. Yeah. And then I'm providing that value. Based on my expertise. Based on my <laughs> expertise. What you probably don't want is them to think that your music is straight trash. Like, even if they don't like your style of music, because that's just not them, they need to at least think you're probably good at your style of music. Yeah, I have to, like, I know me personally, I'll have to maybe not like it, but I can't hate it. Right. You know, like, I got to be like, um, this is this is going to be objectively good to somebody. Right, exactly. <laughs> that's 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 all you're looking for. Yeah. They can say, this is objectively good to somebody. I can help you find that somebody yeah. and then manage what it looks like to explore and build in that audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's about it. And I I know that sounds underwhelming and wow, but that is what it is. And funny enough though, it, it's crazy how globalization has affected music and culture so much because this guy talking about his um not being able to I said this guy, Outcast manager not, talking about not being able to understand Outcast back in the day. Sound like my dad talking about when he came to the South. Cause he's from Newark, New Jersey, mm. and he would just be like, way. "What's up, what?" He's from Joe Budden way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he and he'd be like, "Yo, I never understood what these folks were saying. Like, never." And like one thing, he he would always be like, "He was like, man, I remember I was in a club one time. Everybody was like, go who uh, side of head, go who's who side of head." I was like, "I ain't know what the hell they were saying." <laughs> <laughs> and you remember that show, song, right? <laughs> He was like, he just had all these oh, stories man. of like, you know, like, I was like, I'll be talking to somebody. How far away is it? He's like, oh, you just go down the road a piece. Like, like, what does this mean? Like, the language was so different, but it's a beautiful thing back in the day because you could go to different places and get completely different experiences. Yeah, bro. like going to different regions was damn near like going to different countries today. Yeah, bro. She was like walking through Narnia. You know <laughs> It's crazy. It's cause it would be so, it's so funny to hear like those type of stories, cause now we don't get as shocked because we experience so much of each other online. Yeah, and because of online, we experience a lot of the same culture. So it's the same when we go to these places, and then you get rid of radio, right? The way it was before, because radio is now homogenized to they're pretty much just playing the hits, and you have a couple of companies pretty much owning all the stations, right? Yeah. We don't get as much of an experience of going to a different state, and you just driving, and then you change the radio station to the local shit, and you hear some shit you never hear before, and in a completely different style. Which I miss that part. I'm not old enough for the full like completely misunderstanding other regions, yeah. but I am old enough for like riding around and being in a different state and the shit is just some completely different shit. Yeah. I feel like that hasn't happened in a long time. For me personally, that hasn't happened in a long time. Like, yeah. maybe like I can't put a year on it. It's been a long ass time. That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't even think about that until you said right. that. I just remember finding this one Ace Hood song one day being in Virginia for the first time. It was like, turns on the radio I was like, oh, I don't remember what song it was. Oh, but. damn. <laughs> 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 I was like, oh, shit. Like, Ace Hood. It was some shit that was like just bringing him back at the time. But I don't know, but that shit was like crazy because I was coming from down here and I was like, oh, they are not playing. It's a, it's a, yeah, back home in Atlanta, bro. Like, no, nah, this is not this is not coming through the speaker. So I do miss that aspect of it. But I don't know, man. It, in a way, as bad as it is, I think it makes culture a little bit easier to navigate, at least, because it's all just internet culture. So, you know, if you can speak internet, you can you you good everywhere. You know what I'm saying? And that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> We're sacrificing the unique and different for the same and convenience. And you never gonna have anybody fight convenience. That's like the humans evolving into the, one race. Type the, thing. the humans fate, right? The, the, the <laughs> it's our curse. Like we we it's hard for us to fight convenience, man. Yeah, bro. It's hard, even to our detriment. We, it's hard for us to fight convenience. You know, look, the the bad food. That we eat all everything. Look, man, hey, it's convenient though. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why I be thinking about like the the conspiracy theories. It's like we are gonna all merge into one race. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna be one language. I'm like, but that's memes, bro. Memes are something that every race, every gender, yeah, you know what I'm saying every sexuality, every nation, everywhere, bro, can will all unite over like a meme, bro. That shit's crazy, bro. We talked about this last <laughs> week. Remember, I, I 
I told EJ that he looked like the race that everybody's going to be. You weren't there for that? No, I wasn't there for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, took that up. I forgot how we got there, but I was like, bro, I was like, everybody's going to look like you. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> you can see it now, right? That's funny as fuck. That's funny as fuck. He got a little bit of everything in him. And so, I don't know, man. Um, <laughs> I think, like, of course, again, we know everybody doesn't have to love your music in that way, especially the higher and higher up and the more people you deal with in business, you aren't going to have that expectation. But that doesn't mean there is no value to people in your business stack. All right. They might have some other type of value. They could be close on your team and have exceeding value. But that part just is what it is. And on the other side, though, again, the understanding, man, I I, under, I understand the convenience of culture today, and I appreciate culture today. It's not me <laughs> hating, but it does suck also not to have those differentiated experiences in our fight to, like, I'm of the, the, the side of things where people say, oh, we're all the same race and everybody's the same, da 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 and, and, you know, I don't see color. I don't like that shit, right? <laughs> not according to this meme. Yeah, like, <laughs> I prefer people to experiences the differences, acknowledge the differences, and accept the differences. Yeah. You know, and just not be assholes about it. That's all it is. You know, because the differences is a funny shit, right? That's the cool shit. That's the... Yeah. So, I hope we look. You know, if we homogenize to the point of a billion EJs, hopefully I'm not here <laughs> for it. <laughs> now, with that being said, though, speaking of how Outcast manager... From the North, did not understand understand his Southern artists. Got another clip for you guys. Oh, and this is a good <laughs> one. So I got one question for y'all. How not to get booed? How do you think you can not get booed? One of the best ways in your career to not get booed? Because we're going to talk about something that's going to get you booed for sure. What part of New York? But these folk, nigga, they around the time I got the song with Jada Kid. No. These folk put me at a BB King, bro, but take me to a Met, uh, a Wu Tang Clan. I opened up for Wu Tang Clan. What the fuck? You know what the crowd look that like? That ain't make sense. That Do you know what the crowd look like? It's all back now. I know that. <laughs> I get up there talking about I'm booming, I'm bucking. <laughs> Them folk looking like booming, <laughs> <laughs> bucking. Boom! <laughs> 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 nigga, I'm on the man. Arguing with these folk while I'm back. Like, bro, I be so mad. Nigga, fuck your pussy. I'm mad as hell, boy. I ain't never been booed, fool. Yeah, I know. I ain't never. I'm like, bro, why would they do that? Why would y'all put me on the Wu Tang Clan? No, I'm finna come out here talking about. Nigga, open up for the Wu Tang Clan. The the promoter that set it up is sick. Bruh. (laughs) Bruh. How did they not know better, dog? First of all, the fact that. OJ the Juice Man had a song with Jada Kiss is beyond me. I did I did not catch it was that crazy, one. Bro. I think it was him, Jada Kiss, and like Swiss Beats. I missed that one. Or I just forgot about it. I I definitely you know what I think because we played it one time yeah. here after we saw this clip. And yeah, I I definitely did not know that song. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it, no. All right. <laughs> <laughs> For people who are missing this, because maybe y'all don't know who OJ the Juice Man are. Maybe it is. Y'all don't, you know, you not might not be from the South. OJ the Juice Man was up under Gucci Mane. So the closest, he I'm not going to say he sounds exactly like Gucci Mane. People don't get mad at me who actually know. But for y'all, just imagine a Gucci Mane for now. And then imagine early Gucci Mane without the clout that has any level of respect and recognition. is just Gucci Mane, his style, his early music, and put him in front of Wu-Tang Clan in the 2000s after Wu-Tang Clan is all, already Wu-Tang motherfucking clan. And in New York, bro. In New York, Crazy. make Gucci Man that opener. Crazy, bro. That's how I said that promoter was sick, bro. He just hey. set, he signed that man up for favor. It must bro. have been, you know, paying a little buyout for the spot. They had to pay him I mean, for that spot. It really started with whoever set the feature up. You know, I could understand, like, <laughs> yo, let's try to take this, you know, new age for the time Southern trap artist and break him in front of this this East Coast, you know, boom bap right. audience. That's where the sickness started. Cause I'm like, <laughs> look, that is that is true. That what's is the, true. So, so what's the point? I think it made it for a cool experiment to see. It was a cool experiment, but, yeah. but it was a setup for failure. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. Yeah. Don't open for <laughs> artists that don't have the same audience that you have. 
but but what I do like about this is like this experience is what I tell people to think about when they can't think of a target audience. I'm like, bro, close your eyes and imagine you opening for an artist, bro. Mm. Who will you open for that you think their crowd will boo you? If you think I love that. If you think their crowd will boo you, bro, they're not a, they're, they're bro, not a part of your target. Dude. I love <laughs> that. Like, that is the scientific route, deductive yeah. reasoning, <laughs> where you keep us. You assume that you're wrong originally, yeah. right? And then you keep testing until you're not proven wrong. Yeah, you're not necessarily right, but you cannot figure out a way to prove yourself wrong. Yeah, so. If I imagine all these different people booing me, uh, eventually the people that are left, maybe I should actually perform in their audience. Yeah. I can't be guaranteed that I'm going to be right and I'm not going to get booed, but I can't deduce <laughs> originally from afar that that audience will boo me. So that might be a way a lot of y'all should think about it. Who's going to boo me? Ah, nah, I shouldn't be in front of that audience. Man, don't count the people who got fan bases that are like too nice and too hippy dippy to be mean to people. Nah, even them, man. Even they got their <laughs> limits. They got their limits. They, got their they limits. do have their limits. <laughs> My point is, <laughs> don't 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 try it. Like if you if you're not that target audience, you're not that target audience, and it's a setup for failure, 100 percent, to perform in front of these artists that is not your target audience. And if it's not full failure, it's a waste of your money and time. In many cases, and the reason I say this is because I know a lot of artists get these opportunities to get in front of these audiences for pay like there's i don't know i'm tory lanes traveling the country or omarion and i need an opener and there'll be a potential opening spot and then you get charged 5k 300 dollars, whatever the number is to be in front of this audience it doesn't matter if their base will not like you it doesn't matter so don't waste your money if you have that paid opportunity and more importantly don't waste your time unless Look, you're a sick individual and <laughs> you like to go against the odds. Or you and just want to find out. Right. You want to say, hey, man, I really want to test myself. Yeah. I want to get so good at performing that I could damn near win over a room that's not even for me at the start. Like the Apollo right, style, yeah. style okay, shit, yeah. right? That, that I respect. That, that I respect. But, but you got to be it. You got to be a good performer. Well, yeah. that might be your path to get there. That's fair. You know, everybody That's has fair. that origin story. Not everybody, but you got those people with that origin story. Man, I was in these rooms. It was so hard. People hated me. They came to boo. You had to help them not boo by being so funny or performing your ass off. And you started at that point, so I had to get good, right? Yeah. Maybe that's how you get good experiencing some booze and some and some dead audience yeah no definitely definitely and the other like benefit of the doubt i will give them too is that maybe this show is just how they were able to see the return of that feature because now if it was today right they would just log into spotify for artists and be like oh like our new york stream started going up once we got that you know swiss beast and angelicus feature they could see it without having to put the artist in that situation but yeah. back then like the artist going to shows was the was the test ad. You know what I'm saying? That was the that's how we got the initial sample data. We had to put you in that situation to get you know what I'm saying cut like that for us to know if that was the right move on our part. Which yeah. I'm assuming they learned it wasn't. Now we don't have to put the artist in as many situations that might hurt their feelings. You know what I'm saying? Break their character because we have so much data. But then, like you said, it's arguable that like those experiences are what made them better. Hey, we fucked up yeah. as your label and thought that for whatever reason, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, that <laughs> that boom bap New Yorkers would like your music. Hey, that's our bad, but we learned some very valuable demographic information when they threw those tomatoes at you on stage. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we learned that, hey, maybe all along we should have been pushing you in Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, right? It's things like that that, you know, that they eventually come back to. But I can understand and respect that. Yeah. You know, I can I can get that. And then plus, his part, he probably was just hyped to uh, open up for Wu Tang. But you know how artists be, bro. Sometimes the artists don't even think about, yo, do our demographics match? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're just like, oh, I get to open yeah. up for, for the Wu Tang clan. That's going to be crazy, bro. That's going to be yeah. such a historic moment. It's like, no, bro. No, it's not. Yeah, I mean, no. that's a different type of history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> not the history you want. Hey, yeah, hey, look. So, look, lesson learned. Y'all be mindful of who y'all put y'all's music in front of. We talk about that so much from a standpoint of mm -hmm. because you're trying to capture a certain audience, but we never really get a chance to speak about it in terms of just putting yourself in a bad position and setting yourself up for failure. Knowing your audience. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
All right, now I got a question for you guys. How weird can you get with your fans? How weird can you get with your fans? Corey, how weird can you get with your fans? I feel like a, 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 a six out of 10. Six out of 10? Yeah. All right, I want you, Corey, <laughs> asking y'all to do some shit. <laughs> Check out this clip and why we're asking that question. A lot of valuable advice documentary. and thoughts from DJ Dramo. About this, and it's adult fans of My Little Pony. And I don't know why this is such a, this is such a profound example for me, I think, just because it's something I do not fucking get whatsoever. And if you watch any videos online about it, it is the strangest thing. I can't remember what some, where I originally saw this. I think somebody told me about this. Uh, do you know about this niche? No, Adult bro. fans I, of My Little Pony called Bronies? No, I had no idea. Okay. I, told you, right. I thought what he was saying, like, Bronie at first. Oh, first okay. Show me right. <laughs> but, but it just goes to show you, man, like, don't be afraid to, like, try and, and put yourself out there for the things that you're interested in, no matter how weird they, they may be, because there's a fucking audience for everything out there, right? There's a community, a group of people, like-minded individuals from every weird idea, fetish, concept, whatever it is that you have. Like, there's a community out there for you if you you look hard enough and you actually begin to take action on your interest. Um, and yeah, I guess the the bronies, the, the My Little Pony stands are are the uh, the essence of what I'm trying to push with this idea of if you don't see it, create it. The, <laughs> oh, you gotta keep you gotta finish now that's all i know that's all you know yeah, I ain't heard it's the same thing. words like tw at least twice <laughs> my little know. my little pony my little pony yeah, i don't know that what comes after that i just want to uh, start while i was ahead all right, all right i got you <laughs> i got you so <laughs> look man i think that point is very clear first of all y'all shout shout out to the, the dj y'all y'all follow my boy i mean yeah i think it's just it's too obvious, man. If people can do shit like this, <sighs> bruh, like what's your excuse for not being able to create some level of fan base? I'm not saying everybody should be able to, you know, have the most fans in the world, but if you can't find your hundred, a strong hundred, then there's something seriously wrong there because there are some weird fetishes out there. There are some yeah. weird, uh, and people interest. got their interest, man. People yeah, got it's, their it's, interest, it's some man. interest out there. You know what I mean? That's how yeah. I felt about the furries first time I learned about them. Oh uh, yeah. My uh sister was at a hotel. Okay. And she was like calling me. She said, Sean, bro, there's just all these people out. They're like grown people, like wearing tails and shit. And and I think some of them are doing like some weird sexual stuff to the way they're acting or whatever. Like she, she's just telling me this is how I first found out about them. And she's like, I think it's called furries. That's how I first learned out <laughs> learned about this. Like just hearing about it on the phone back talking about like some old school shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you just hear about shit and have to use your imagination, <laughs> like not Google it or whatever and see what it looked like. So I already had like a wild ima ima imagination based off of that, but it was apparently a whole convention of it. Right. And look, you probably know more about furries than I do. You seem more confident that's, around the subject. That's crazy. Like, that's wild that you just threw that on. <laughs> that you just threw that on me like that. They can't see my face or nothing. That's a that's a hard pen. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I'm I'm not uncomfortable because bro, I'm on the internet, bro. Like you you see things, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like you on YouTube a little too late. For a little too long, you know what I'm saying? You fall asleep on the wrong video. <laughs> <laughs> like you wake up to some stuff, man. But but I like the that sentiment because he's he's pretty much proven like, bro, like there's so many other ways for you to keep people interested, you know? Yeah. And bro, I'm always telling like clients and things. I don't know. I just kind of have this concept that when it comes to talking to your fans, the conversation needs to be like, I like your music, and you know what I'm saying? Like, I like mm. your music. And you're in the basketball, like I'm in the basketball. So I could DM you at two o'clock in the morning and be like, yo, did you see the game last night? And like, you might actually hit me back, you know? And so I think, like he said, like, bro, like you have the ability to build off of your personal interests mm. and your personal, just things that you're into, no matter how like weird or strange or, or strange you might think it is. And there's somebody out there that likes it, right? Like you're yep. not the only person that's into this subject matter or cares about this thing. And if you just, put it out there that you even care about it, the people that like it will start to become attracted to you, right? Yeah. Are you gardening? Yo, I fuck with gardening. Let me come, you know what I'm saying? Check out your three song gardening EP, you know? Gardening, sports, entertainment in general, 
uh, what? We medicine politics. politics. Sounds very the body. Yeah, and I know multiple artists that are doing things around politics. I've seen artists use cryptocurrencies as yeah. like their niche somehow. There's so many other niches that you can grab a hold to. And here's the reality. Today, I don't care that you used to see artists only do music and go crazy. That's not today. It just isn't. And I think we have to have artists accept that reality that this is today. Because the reality of the there was an era that existed where artists could only do music and they didn't have to know how to do content. It's just that it was an era and it isn't something that had to happen. There is no right or wrong for any of this shit, right? Yeah. Like now is today. Now today is a time where someone who has personality and good content is someone who can win and has an advantage. At one point, it was an advantage for people who could just sing their asses off. Yeah. Right? Today, now we got auto-tune. So I don't want to hear anybody who uses auto-tune complain that they can't just do music because you're kicking somebody else off who used to just do this one thing in a certain way and kill the game. Yeah. Right? None yeah. of this shit is a specific right or wrong way is just errors of time and everybody has to figure out how to win and exist in their era of time. And I think artists think they're entitled sometimes to have it a certain way and it just be about music. No, I understand to want it that way because you can still do the music back in the day and then probably try to figure out how to flip and do even better. It's nice to just be able to do one thing and go crazy and get all the revenue, get all the fans and be good. And then everything else be extra today. We aren't there. We're a lot of times many artists have to do multiple things to just survive. Yeah. But it also doesn't matter. And that's a beautiful thing that you could be a YouTuber and have some music and your music does well, but maybe music isn't the main thing you're getting content off of, getting revenue off of, all right, and living your life off of. Maybe you you do still go perform and have some fans. But you're not touring and doing all these other things. Because a lot of artists hated touring, by the way. Right? There's a lot of people who didn't like it then. And there's hella artists now, especially, who do not like touring. How are you going to replace that revenue? Yeah. Other shit. So it's a gift and a curse. And I think we just have to accept it that even the consumers have evolved mentally where they don't necessarily care if you're just an artist or not. And even though you might not necessarily become a musical goat right that also is fine if you're living a life that you want to and you're doing it in a way that you want to yeah right yeah yeah man it's like you said bro it's always gonna come down to what consumers want man we always gonna win like the, the stuff that we're trying to get but you said something that to me is why this is important is one it opens up where your brand can go right so it opens up the type of like brand yeah. deals like you know we've talked about your brand is really a lot of times just like communicated interests and personality traits, right? Like I'm, I really care about you know animal rights and whatever, whatever. So I talk about it out loud, and that's that's my brand to certain people. So yep. it allows you to diversify things in a certain way. It allows you to diversify even your artist narrative. Like I think about an artist like Todd the Creator, and when he first started kind of rebranding into the whole like high end fashion space that he's in now, you know, with the you know, the $2,000 suitcases and the, you know, however $100 cologne and like what he's kind of done with like golf wing. And I don't remember exactly where it started, but I think it started with him just letting us know he was in like, like high end cars and like cars a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like, so you start thinking like, man, like for Todd the Crater to be in the cars, he must got money. You know what I'm saying? He must really be out here eating. You know what I'm saying? It's like, um, <laughs> yeah. Somewhere. And then it's like, that was the bridge. Like I think about it now, like watching it over those however many years, like four or five years and seeing where he's flipped the brand to today. And it's like, damn, where they all just started because like he let us know he's in the cars. And then like cars are such a big part of like, you know, like music videos and like just his story and just like uh, other worlds that he's been able to flip into. And it just was like, started by him going like, yo bro, I fuck with cars. You know what I'm yeah. Like that's something I'm really into. And so it's like, these things give you the ability to be able to build in other spaces than just music. But, but you as the artist still have the power to then bring that world back into the music, right? And so now it's like, yo, I'm the, I'm, it's like Thanos, right? Like I'm the artist with either just the music space and you know, that could be powerful. I could be the artist that has control over the music space, the sports space, you know what I'm saying? The fashion space, 
you know what I'm saying? The video game space, like this community, this community, and I have the ability to bring them all together. When it's music time, like the people that can do that, bro, are like powerful. Like, that shit is crazy. Bro, because you're an artist. Yeah. Right? I think so many artists today actually sell themselves short without even knowing they're doing it. Yeah. And you, like I'm just a music artist. Yeah, yeah. You, you, what's the word? Demote yourself to being a musician. Mm. And look, I love musicians, right? But- if you use the term artist, that assumes creativity beyond just music, mm-hmm. right? So why don't you take on that creativity, take on that challenge? I've never, I've never seen so many artists basically say, yo, no, I don't want to be creative. I want less creativity. I just want to be seen one way. Mm-hmm. Like when, do you, when have you ever seen really artists for real say that? in so many masses and as much as you see today usually artists are like i want to be known for more than just this i yeah. don't just want to be in this box now artists are like nah i just want to be seen in this box so and i think it's that it's that uh sensibility of just not being pleased where it's like because it's being is becoming difficult all of a sudden you want it mm-hmm. right versus because I think if it was very easy for you to become an artist, all right, then you have artists just talking about wanting to be seen as other things. But since they're having difficulty being being seen as just an artist or finding success as just an artist, they're focusing on that and like, why I do other things. But the reality is, again, you can, your world can go so far beyond that. And today people don't really care. And why does it matter? Right. Remember. A lot of these numbers, the charts that we're looking at, Billboard, all these things are industry things. All these uh, milestones and, and and measuring boards, that's an industry thing, right? It's not necessarily about you, the success of your life, success of your career. So why does that have to be a certain amount of streams for you to feel successful as an artist? Mm-hmm. You create it. You're an artist, right? Maybe you want to have a, a certain amount of fans. Cool. Work towards that number. But it doesn't mean that you have to make all your money primarily from it. But you do have people who love your your music. You can use your art in terms of music and your music videos as a way to consolidate all of your worlds. And maybe that's just a way that you consolidate the marketing of the rest of your brand and then you monetize only the rest of your brand. And as you continue to experience different parts of the world and whoever you are and you communicate that through your artistry, whether that's through regular content um, video games, whatever your canvases are, then you come back and say again, all right, now I'm going to create some more music with the the me that is now grown into something else and then let you know what my current world looks like. Yeah. Right? Consolidating, oh, now I got sports and and I don't know, we and some kind of political thoughts all in this video somehow. I, like it it again, it just it's just no rules to it, and I and I feel like we seek rules so much, right? We seek a specific path so much, and I think that's where artists like get really discouraged because it really isn't there, mm-hmm. and people talk as if it's there, and you see so many people achieving certain things that you want, but how did they get there? Well, in the music industry, we know oftentimes. Even within music success, it came so many different ways. Like you knew somebody, you ran into somebody random and became a, um, a manager. And then as a manager, you were out one day and you linked with this one artist because your friend invited you out. And all of a sudden, y'all are cool. And then, bam, y'all go together. Or y'all went to school together. Or you had a, a relative. Or you had nobody. Like All these different versions exist. Mm-hmm. And then how people experience your music. All this stuff is completely different. Um, the best thing to do when it comes to this music shit is hear everything that people are saying that actually know what they're talking or they're talking about and take their perceptions as a framework, right? That's what I like learned just early on more from coding, but just looking at everything as framework. So Jacory says some shit and I'm like, okay, I now have the framework of seeing this problem the way Jacory sees it. And then I might talk to Sam and then I might talk to, you know, x y and z and i just take their ways of seeing the problems and it doesn't even mean now that i think it that way mm-hmm. it doesn't even matter if it's right or wrong just understanding that there's other people who see this problem this way and now like a fucking like super villain or something 
I can now like say, well, now I'm going to take all these perspectives and view this one problem this way and have this super intelligence. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can look at music. Right. Because there are so many routes. You can't just say, oh, because Jacory and his artists blew up this way. We can move this way. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not going to apply because it's a different time or it's a different style or maybe their personalities or their skill sets are able to capitalize off of it differently. But you can't say they did that and this other artist did this and use that as a way of looking at problems to see things differently and possibly call upon a part of that advice or a part of their story in a space that fits within yours. Yeah, 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 I agree, I agree. Like, it's such a, it's such a weird, um, I don't know, I think it's, it's such a weird experience for most of us to leave a world of structure and right and wrong like school and then be thrown out into this industry of music chaotic whirlwind of an industry chaotic and i think the biggest problem is entrepreneurs are many of them are allergic to rules in some ways Mm. and they're looking to create their own rules and create something different but artists aren't coming into music saying i'm trying to be an entrepreneur you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. They find out that they have to be an entrepreneur and see things different. But if you're an entrepreneur, you're already like, oh, if I leave my company to then be an entrepreneur, I know that I'm going to be doing something different. I'm going outside of the norm. Artists think they're going into something that's already established and structured, but you get in that bitch and figure, find out that, yo, this is a fun house. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell is this shit? You know, so I, I do get that it could be a, a shock. But at some point, if you want to win, you know, we all have to get over it. Yeah. That's fact. just music. That's fact, bro. That's, fact. That's just music, man. Last topic of the day. And one of the most important things for artists to understand that most artists still, after they understand this, will never do it. And I'll tell you why. Snoop Dogg is talking about Nipsey Hussle in this clip, by the way. The Compton movie, right? So Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, all them niggas calling me. Man, we trying to get... <clears throat> Nip to play you and straight out of Compton. He ain't getting back to us. All right, let me holler at the um, boat. <clears throat> I hit him up. Nip, let me holler at you. Pull up on me. He come over to the spot. God, they want you to play me in, uh, in the straight out of Compton movie. I'm happy as a motherfucker to tell him. He like, no disrespect, big homie. But I can't play you in the movie because then people going to just know me for being you. I got to be me. And that's what all due respect. I was like, damn, that was gangsta as a motherfucker. I called him and I said, cuz, y'all gotta go find somebody else. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so why is this clip so important? There, there's a lot of things to pull from it. One, I mean, I think it takes a lot of discipline, personal vision, and really balls to do something like that. Yeah, 100%. All right, and I mean, that's Nipsey Hussle. That's how he built the brand that he built. But why does it take those things? And why did he say what he said? It's really branding. That's what it comes down to. All right. If I step in your shoes, especially this early in my career, I'm always going to be seen in these shoes. It's going to be hard to get about those shoes once I get in them. Yeah. yeah. Especially with so many similarities they, they probably already got with them being you know, West Coast artists, tall, Bruh. lanky guys. You know what I'm saying? Before like, I, I, yeah. I ever heard this story, I always thought Nipsey had Snoop Dogg vibes. Yeah. Like, more than his kid. Like, he got the same, like, nose, look, vibe, voice. And there's a lot of West Coast dudes that don't sound like Snoop Dogg. So it's not like every West Coast dude that sound exactly like him. They got the yeah. cadences and stuff, but, like, that sound exactly like him. Nip would sound like him sometimes. Yeah, bro. It's like that whole one, like, your friends tell you you look like somebody, and then you get the chance to play them in the movie. It's like, nah, man. It's the ultimate validation for all them niggas. I'm not giving them that. Right. <laughs> hey, that's about that's some old other stuff right there. <laughs> I was like Penny, low key, but but look, legitimately, you have to be that confident in your brand and what you want to see from your brand and your ability to actually achieve that brand vision one day to be able to turn down something like yeah, this. Yeah, right? Yeah. It takes a lot. And this is why I said it's something important for artists to understand, but even after artists will understand it, most won't actually adhere to it because if they get an opportunity like this, 
people gonna take it. Yeah, like that's the extreme version of that, you know. Like, cause I, I guess small version would be like you got invited, you got invited somewhere that you know what I'm saying doesn't 100 percent align with your brand. But you're like, no, this is an event with bro, a, a movie role to play one of the most iconic rap stars ever in a in a movie that you probably feel like is gonna be iconic at some point. Yep. You know. That's yeah. what you said, bro. Kudos to him, man, because I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know if I could have did it. Yeah, look, man, I think it's, one, it's cool to see how Snoop was able to take it respectfully and that Nip was able to get deal out respectfully. But I think a question that everybody should ask themselves as an artist hearing something like this, like, what is your brand vision? Yeah. Right? Because I always try to make sure that people understand your brand is not just what you do, it's what you don't do. And we focus so much on what we do we never consider what we don't do but if you don't if you don't decide what you don't do and will not do ahead of time when the opportunities come you'll get caught slipping and go off path without even realizing it. it's like oh man dang i did say i wouldn't do anything like this you know i did say that that didn't fit my brand vision but the opportunity was so lucrative i wasn't even thinking about it in the moment and now i played myself all right. Will Smith and Jada Pinkett had this thing that they said. At, I, I remember seeing this clip about their family and their kids. Right. They were like getting your priorities in order. And as a couple, we had our certain priorities. Family is number one priority. Right. And what that means is if we're at the Oscars and last minute we find out Willow Jaden is sick, there's some emergency. We don't have to make the decision in the moment because we made the decision ahead of time. Yeah. All right. We know family first. We need a dip. Not, oh, my gosh, this is such an important event. Uh, What should we do? How can I make this and work this out? And then you end up playing yourself one way or another, whether it means you took longer than you should have to make the decision or you ultimately did make the wrong decision and you stayed at the show. If your priorities are that, maybe your, your priority is a. Money over family or yeah. awards and accolades over family, whatever that looks like. Right. But it making those decisions ahead of time, I love that idea since the moment I heard it. Because when you have those priorities in order, it's almost nothing to think about. Yeah, right. So um, shout out to Nip, man. You know, he's one of those folks that have story after story from many people who have met him and dealt with him in any way. Um, I'm always excited to hear a new Nip story. So if anybody have any dope ones, y'all drop some in the comments. You know, y'all drop some in the comments. We would love to hear and see some of the best nip videos out there. Other than that, we appreciate y'all once again, as always. Um, and thank you yet again, Black Paul Phoenix, for your super thanks donations, you know, and letting us know that super thanks even exists. Right. Other than that, I'm Brandman Sean. I'm Corey. And we're out. <laughs>